Oh. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel, and this is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series, and I am super happy to have Brittany Miles with us today. Hey, Brittany. Hi, Frank. Thanks for inviting me here. Well, thank you so much for being to talk about your very lovely article. It's very nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hey, Brittany, where are, you, where are you located at these days? So I'm in Tucson, Arizona. I am a postdoc at the University of Arizona. Cool. And I just got my PhD last year in June. Awesome. Congratulations, Dr. Miles. Very yeah. nice. Uh, and so uh, you are about 90 to 100 miles um, from me. I'm here in Phoenix. You're in Tucson. And so um, yeah. summer's coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you've never had the pleasure of enjoying one in Arizona, you will see. <laughs> Yeah, I turned the AC on for the first time. Uh, mm. Yeah. Yeah, you funny. don't have to do that too much in Santa Cruz. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although I will say, it, okay, the first time I saw snow was in Tucson. So that's my, my, oh. <laughs> that's my reference scale on the weather. So did you like go up to Mount Lemon or something like that? Or you go up to Flagstaff or something? No, right outside in the. <laughs> in Tucson? Wow. Yeah. Oh, that must yeah. have been like three weeks ago, something like that, four weeks ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had snow on the, the the local hills out here, and I was like stunned. The snow in Phoenix, it was like amazing. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. I did not know it snowed in Phoenix, but yeah, <laughs> it usually doesn't. <laughs> it was pretty wild. Very cool. Uh, and Brittany, what do you like to do for research? So I like to study the atmospheres of brown dwarfs, uh, mainly through infrared spectroscopy to understand. Uh, what kind of gaseous molecules are in the atmospheres, uh, what kind of clouds are present, um, well, how strongly the atmosphere is mixing through the column and things like that. Cool. And I also work on infrared instrumentation. Ooh, the proverbial double threat instrumentation and observer. Very okay. good. Awesome. And that is going to bring us to this very awesome APJ letter. So it's open access, people. You can go grab a copy for free. And number two, I want you to notice that this is a 19-page APJ letter. So the primary um, metric for a letter is impact. Length is a secondary concern. So 19-page APJ letter. The JWST Early Release Science Program for Direct Observations of Exoplanetary Systems 2 a 1 to 20 micron spectrum of the planetary mass companion BHS 1256-1257B, and that was a mouthful, and Brittany, take us away. <laughs> so before I dig into like um, the details of the paper, I just want to, you know, talk about what the ERS program is, I guess. Um, so the early release science program is an open call uh, that the community answers, and we put forth our best proposals to do the science that will determine how well JWC can do science we care about. Okay. And so the direct imaging ERS program is aimed at understanding how well can JWST characterize the thermal emission, the thermally emitted light from gases um, exoplanets. And so we chose this companion VH, you can't see my cursor, but VHS 1256B um, because it is a very fairly isolated brown dwarf that has similar mm -hmm. atmospheric you know, features and colors as the HRD799 planetary system. Okay. Cool. So we want to look at a fairly easy target where we're not competing with a bright host star to get good data. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. Very good. Yeah. You got uh, a lot of co-authors here. Yes. And so since the ERS program is uh, like a community-based project, we have a long list of uh, co-authors who contributed to planning the observations, Understand how understanding how to get the best data reduction. We have people tackling atmospheric modeling things, and we also have um, senior people like Andy Skimmer, Sasha Hinckley, and Beth Biller who organized the collaboration. So everyone on this list contributed to this work here. Nice, very good, very cool. very large, very cool. Okay, let's get into it. And we can start with the, the first figure. We'll go to figure one. Okay, color, color. So, uh, and the target audience is like astronomers, right? You uh, can go hardball astronomy. <laughs> okay, cool. Go for it. So this is a HR diagram showing um, brown dwarfs and these, uh, these small circles. 
Those are uh, infrared colors of brown dwarfs. And at the top of the figure, you have the brighter L-type brown dwarfs. And at the bottom, you have the cold, colder T-type um, brown dwarfs. Okay. And then the hexagons are directly imaged exoplanets. That, wow. And so brown dwarfs and directly imaged exoplanets occupy the same temperature range. And so we can study brown dwarfs to understand the atmospheres of directly imaged exoplanets. Okay. Does, our, the, does the size of the hexagon mean anything? Uh, no, it's just for visual clarity and to make them distinct from the okay. brown dwarfs. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh oh, we froze. You back? Oh. You're back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> froze there for a second. Okay. No problem. Basically, this planet has the same colors. This brown dwarf has the same uh, colors as the other planets. So that's why we studied it. Got it. And then let's go down to the next figure. Sure. One. We got the observations, the reduction. Table of the observations, table of the married backgrounds, and figure two, lovely, lovely, lovely. Okay. So this figure is the final product of a bunch of hard work. So this spectrum is one of the most complete data sets of a brown dwarf or planetary mass companion to date. Very cool. It covers one to 15 microns, basically continuously. And uh, you know, around like 1.5 microns or like uh, several of the, the dips in the infrared bands uh -huh. uh, would be hard to get from the ground because, you know, Earth's atmosphere has its own emission and it contributes to a lot of um, noise in our data. So we have very good coverage uh, across the whole spectral energy distribution of this object. That thing is great. That's lovely. And there's some, we'll zoom in on the features, but I just want to talk about like some okay. of the, the instruments we use. Mm -hmm. So we use the IFU mode of near spec uh, to get spectroscopy of the target, um, even though it's fairly isolated. We just wanted to see, you know, for an IFU, can it reproduce the spectrum of an isolated point source? Okay. And for MIRI, we also use the, it's more of a, it's, it, they're both image slicers, but uh, we use the IFU mode of M MIRI MRS to also get a spectrum of this object from about five micron to 16 microns. Okay. There and okay. channel four has yeah. really low signal to noise. So there should be a spectrum here, but we have to compile it into a photometry point for the channel 4A. Okay. And that's over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you go down a bit, um, water, alkalines, methanes, and then the water overlap region. Okay. So this shows the overlap between near spec and MIRI. So when basically, um, you know, we're still in development with our pipelines. So we have to do some of the flux calibration manually. So this is just showing how well overlap we got the near spec and MIRI data yeah. um, for both different instruments showing that they can produce consistent science between the two on the observatory. Very cool. And the gray? Those are error bars. Got it. OK, yeah. cool. Thank you. Uh, and we can go down to actually like look at the spectra a little bit. Let's go. CO, clouds, CO2, and some of the spectra. Let's see. How do we want to do this? We will do a global, and I'll zoom in as need be if you will drill down on one. OK, there we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So um, you 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 noticed that we did sections on individual uh, molecules, but I'll I'll talk to them through the plots. Okay. So um, in the shorter wavelengths of near spec, where the first one that covers one to one point eight micron, mm -hmm. uh, you have a combination of very broad features and also like like doublet uh, lines from like. Um, sodium and potassium, yep. and also you have water here. Mm -hmm. And so okay. there's a pl plot later, but the sodium and potassium lines, how thick or thin those lines are can tell you about the surface gravity of the brown dwarf. Cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and these water features are some of the clearest you would see on a brown dwarf because we're not competing with Earth's atmosphere. 
Uh, right. Yes. Very good. All right. We got water. And then 1.8 to 3 microns, the second panel, you also have a continuation of that water feature. Yes. Okay. And if you zoom in a bit around 2.3 microns. I will zoom in 2.3. Mm -hmm. You can see some CO here. Um, yep. The main part is the, the dip. That's the most obvious feature. Yeah. But this also highlights some improvements that can be made with the data as well, where we have these um, data artifacts that are the wobbles here. So okay. there, since this paper was published, there's been changes to the pipeline. So we do know that like these features can be removed. Okay, cool. Very good. And we also have uh, the last two panels. You have the absorption features due to methane here. So you have a very clear... Uh, dip at 3.3 microns yes, where methane yes. has the strongest opacity. Uh, right. So on these bottom figures, I have two things plotted. I have the spectrum plotted in black, and then I have uh, opacity curve plotted in colors, either in orange or purple. Oh. Okay. So where the opacity curve goes up, that's where you expect an absorption feature. Got it. Got it. Uh-huh. And so it really lines up with methane, and we have right. this really nice, beautiful carbon monoxide feature on mm -hmm. these brown work. Yeah. Very good. Very cool. And let's keep going. Keep going. We got figure four. And then we got, let's see, this is a full one. So we'll just get a global first and zoom in as need be. So this is kind of like the, so. It, it is fairly easy to take a near infrared spectrum of a brown dwarf from the ground. Miri is really like, this is a new arena and we're effectively doubling the wavelength coverage we typically get on brown dwarfs. And so this is a spectrum, this is spectrum from six to 18 microns here showing, uh, it's not obvious to see, but I'm just highlighting what are the biggest contributing molecules in the atmospheric models we're using. Okay. So the biggest features are water, methane, and we have this very big dip due to a silicate cloud here. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. And actually detecting detecting silicate clouds or silicate-like absorption features is important because these cloud features impact the near-infrared um, the in, near infrared signal energy distribution of the object. So these clouds impact the entirety of the spectrum. And getting the signal can help you understand what's the distribution of particles in the atmosphere and things like that. Okay, very good. Uh, are those just random questions? So the clouds um, constant? Mm -hmm. Do they cover the whole thing, or are they transient? The clouds come and go. So that's a good question. They typically you can have both types. You know, on Jupiter there are bands that are long-standing, or you can have hot spots and things like that. Got but it. Because brown dwarfs show variability, so does this one, is probably some kind of patchy surface, okay. which is a combination of like clouds or hot spots. But we won't know until you spend the time to look at the variability or uh, the time series data for it. Okay. Didn't mean to take you off track there. Just curious. No, it's a it's a good question. This is one of the most variable objects we know about. Yeah. Okay. And these are just some zoom ins from seven microns to nine microns and 16 to um 22. And there's our opacity curve again for some methane, CH4. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think this is a little more tentative. I'm just plotting some like opacities that are likely to be contributing here. I think Miri is one of the more challenging um, portions of the spectrum to match for okay. these objects. Okay. Uh, and then let's go down a bit. Okay. Figure five, slide down. And figure six, ooh, nice, okay. And here we're doing just some visual comparisons between this um, planetary mass companion to other field brown dwarfs that are typically very old. So a lot of directly emitted exoplanets, we can look at them because they're really young and hot, yeah. whereas isolated brown dwarfs tend to be very old. And so even though they're similar effective temperatures, they have different surface gravities and that impacts the features we see. Yes. Okay. So VHS, I'm not a fan of spectral types. That's just something the community does a lot. <laughs> but um, I, yeah, mm, I don't want to say too much, but I think like, okay, so VHS 1256B <laughs> is basically a L8 
Um, and these top mm -hmm. three brown dwarfs are ordered from hottest to coldest, L6, L8 to T2. Okay. And boom, boom, boom. Yep. these features, the um, sodium and potassium lines are very uh, deep in the normal brown dwarfs and very shallow in VHS 26B. So and that is due yes. to the low surface gravity of, of this brown dwarf. Okay, so it's puffy. Okay. Very good. Okay. And ditto with the K lines. Yeah. Also muted. Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. And then uh good. We can go down a bit and then Okay. Ooh, and now we get into the modeling. EGP. And here we go, figure seven. Okay. So I, I want to emphasize that this is, you know, the data was public immediately. So we kind of had to rush to do things. So this is not the final say on what is and what isn't in this atmosphere. I, I want to make that clear. Okay. But uh, based on Akari spectra, uh, this is a satellite by JAXA that also took spectra of brown dwarfs. We know that uh, late L dwarfs and T dwarfs probably have some carbon dioxide in their atmosphere. And so we did, we made an attempt at modeling to understand if we have a model with and without CO2, does it get a better fit? And so that's what I'm demonstrating these in these plots. So okay. the data are plotted in black again, mm -hmm. and the model with carbon uh, dioxide is plotted in orange, and the model without CO2 is plotted in blue. Okay. And so, uh, and then on the bottom, I'm showing just the residuals between the two models. Mm. And yeah. You, you get slightly rest residuals if you include CO2. So this is just some evidence for it. I think yeah. there needs to be better modeling that sh matches the overall SCD. Okay. And so let's go down so we can actually show, you know, that we still have a lot of work to do on this object. What was the equation? I missed that. Okay. Discussion and best fit atmospheres. Okay. So um, regarding that equation, we had to use a a two model approach. Uh, so we com we had to combine basically two different cloud models to recreate the overall SCD of this object. Okay. So typically okay. a lot of people just make uh, one slab at a specific pressure uh, okay. and, and they model the atmosphere that way, but this required two slabs at least to match these very muted squashed near infrared features that okay. you see. Got it. Got it. Okay. And so, mm -hmm. and uh, can you scroll up a bit so we can see oh, both? Sorry. Things? No, uh, sorry, scroll down to figure eight, my bad. Oh, it's all good. Figure eight, there we go. So the, the data are plotted in black again, and then our best attempt model is plotted in red. And the fraction is 0.6 between the oh, two of them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Okay. So we had to linearly combine two different cloud distributions um, to get this model. That's uh -huh. um, that's what that equation was for. Uh huh. Uh -huh. And even with our best attempt, I mean, we can match the general shape of it, but we're not matching any absorption features. Mm. So one of the biggest features, like water, CO, even the silicate feature. Yeah. are not adequately matched with this model. And that doesn't mean we don't know anything. That just means some more fine tuning has to be done in future work. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so there will be some follow-up papers from our collaboration detailing how to get those um, features down better. Nice. Okay. And then let's go down a bit to show some of the evolutionary um, fitting yeah. or luminosity fitting balls or luminosities and yes looks, looks like atmosphere okay uh oh yeah sorry we we do have i can talk about this a little bit so uh these are plots just outlining some of the parameters of our model and the best attempt so on the left uh so Brown dwarfs have a pressure temperature profile. At a certain height, you'll have a given pressure and temperature. And as you go along down the atmosphere, uh, you follow this black curve. Mm -hmm. And here is just showing both of those combined models we use and right. how, and these dashed lines are the condensation curves of different cloud species. Yes. So 
if you are the to the left of that line, that means at that pressure and temperature, that cloud will be able to condense in that atmosphere. I'm with you. And so um, I forget if this forest rider institite, but the, the blue line uh, is likely a species that can contribute to that 10 micron feature. Uh, yeah, you get some silica in there, yep, uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. And on the right, you have, again, pressure plotted versus cloud layer optical depth. Okay. And so, um, like, I'm not a theorist, so, but this is some insight into, you know, how op opaque or thin these different cloud models are. Okay. And we had to combine uh, both of these to match this, um, to match the spectrum. Okay. And so these, these different cloud parameters have, di they have a similar base level, but they have different extents in the atmosphere. Yeah, right. Uh-huh. De definitely. Okay, I'm with you. And this, on the bottom, we have just, again, pressure versus volume mixing ratio. So that's volume mixing ratios, you know, how much of that molecule is in the atmosphere. Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And okay. so, um, you know, things like water are pretty consistent throughout the atmosphere, but these other molecules like methane, carbon monoxide, CO2, are affected by the atmospheric mixing through the column of the atmosphere. So uh, depending, depending on how quickly the atmosphere is mixing and how different, how fast different molecules convert back and forth between each other, uh -huh. that can change the abundance that you observe with JWST. Yep. 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 I was gonna ask if there was chemistry in that model to yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the last one just shows the KZZ, which is the eddy diffusion coefficient. Ooh. This shows how strong the atmosphere is mixing at a given pressure. Yes. And we have much stronger mixing at uh, higher pressures and uh, higher temperatures uh, compared to the upper atmosphere. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so I think it's a little hard to see, yeah. but if you go back to the molecular, uh, the volume mixing ratios, uh -huh. Um, these abundances are kind of anchored a bit, like they're constant above a certain pressure. Right. And so if when a molecule is quenched, like is basically the mixing is so fast that the abundance is anchored to the lowest pressure pressure, um, where that molecule can, you know, retain its abundance. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. I understand that model a little bit. Okay, I think I could explain that better, but yeah, I just wanted to I don't I wanted to highlight the importance of that <laughs> theoretical work because it it does have impacts for like the how this observatory needs to be used to study brown dwarfs in the future. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Ooh, variability. There was my question. Variability and figure ten. So the reason we had that variability section was to emphasize, or so there was a big ground based uh, effort led by Beth Biller to track this object's variability before our observations because we want to know if there's some flux offset is that because of variability or is the telescope needing some extra calibrations Prepare. and so hmm? yeah <laughs> so we 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 got lucky in that uh this object is very very it's very variable but we were likely observing in a low period and the data are fairly contemporaneous okay so we didn't have to worry about the variability in this data set okay um, yeah. Good. And then we get to the luminosity tracks. Okay. Yes. So brown dwarfs, they, unless they're burning deuterium, they typically don't produce their own heat. They have, form with the heat they have and just collapse over time and lose luminosity. Okay. And so using um, evolutionary models for brown dwarfs, uh, we can estimate you know, what is the mass of this object uh, mm. given its age? So mm. this object has a host star and we can estimate its age from that. And so we have an age, we have a luminosity from the spectrum covering one to 15 microns, mm -hmm. and we can infer the mass of the planet based on that. Nice, okay. And so okay. this yellow on the top panel, we have the luminosity versus age. Yes. And this luminosity range uh, this we have a luminosity range with the errors, and we also have an age range for this object. And based on that um, and statistics, we can estimate 
what is the most likely uh, mass of this object? And that's what's plotted on the bottom panel here, mm -hmm. where we have sort of a bimodal distribution yeah. uh, around, you know, 12 Jupiter masses. Also, there's some probability from 14 to 18 Jupiter masses, but the most likely is less than ju uh, 13 Jupiter masses. And uh, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that lines up with these mass tracks on the top. Yeah, they were certainly ballparky. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people care about this because 13, 13 Jupiter masses is the magic number for something being like a planet, uh, versus not. Mm -hmm. But I think you would need to understand, you know, exactly how something formed, which is uh open question in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay, very good. And we got the atmospheric chemistry, and I think we got one more. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so this really highlights, you know, why there is a silicate feature there empirically too. Um, so the gray data are the JWC data bent down a little bit, and then these blue data are old Spitzer, um, IRS spectra of brown dwarfs. Okay. And so. This L4 is relatively like slanted and flat along these wavelengths. And we're showing that relative to this hotter brown dwarf, there is some deviation from this line. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. And then the other object has a silicate feature and then from a previous paper, and we're comparing ours to that one. Got it. Not bad. Yeah. Very cool. Very so, cool. So um, that's, I, that's the main highlights of the paper. I think we have a lot to learn about this object. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My favorite silicon clouds. And they're gone. And we do. Okay. Brittany, I want to thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely JWST early release article. Very nice. No problem. Uh, and you touched on a little bit uh, there a couple of times. So, so let me um, push on that a little bit. Um, uh, you know, where, where do you think we go with this over the next two to four years? Is there going to be additional JWST observations? You mentioned a little bit about, um, refining the theory modeling, uh, you talked yeah. about variability. So, so where do you think we go with this object? And maybe there's some new telescopes like the Roman telescope or something along those lines. So where do you think yeah. we go with this, um, with this system over the next two to five years? I got you. So, uh, the biggest challenge right now is making sure our modeling capabilities can actually represent the data in a in a way that we actually believe. So actually, one of the challenges right now is that uh, sorry we have they have dogs. Uh, but one of the challenges with uh, there's two okay there's two ways people typically approach atmospheric modeling. That's forward modeling where you produce a grid with assumed physics and then you match it with the spectrum and then you have atmospheric retrievals where based on the data points you slightly change like an abundance or pressure temperature profile to match the data. Right. So Honestly. right now, forward modeling is a lot easier to match the data, but with retrievals, it's been challenging because you, uh, one, it's computationally expensive um, to match all that data and you have to lose data quality to, um, you have to, basically people are bending down data to use atmospheric retrievals and not using the whole information. Yes. So I think there is, that's a some in, yeah. yeah, there's clearly some computational needs to actually use the full like capabilities of, you know, what theorists use nowadays to apply to JWST data. Uh -huh. And then the other way, the, wait, what? The other way, the second way. Yeah. So, or, mm -hmm. Wait, sorry, I didn't hear that. There was the forward modeling and then there is. Oh, the retrievals is the front that the I think. Got yeah, it. that that needs um, That's right. computational development, but I there that doesn't mean forward models are not in the clear yet. You know, there are some molecules we still don't understand, like how does this operate at this temperature and pressure and things like that. So there's a lot of validation work to go on okay. um, in the next couple of years. Uh, with the extra signal to noise that JWC can provide, I think we need to start asking, like you know can we start accounting for like an overall metallicity, C to O ratios and things like that? Um, actually understanding how strong atmospheric mixing is, how far down it reaches in the atmosphere. Um, and basically just, just look and see, 
because uh, there's all these wavelengths we never had to match our models against. And so I think we're we're just we're just in exploratory mode right now. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I really look forward to uh, seeing our characterization of the system develop a lot over the next couple of years. It'd be very nice. Very awesome. You seem to be interested in silicates. I would say, what's your what's something you're like you're really looking forward to on that front? Compositions. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> they will dictate a lot <laughs> and they will tell you a lot. Um, so yeah, silicon carbon oxygen, all my friends. <laughs> yeah. I I I hope someone else points at another brown door for Miri, because you can clearly tell like what type of silicate is there or what size the grain is, but mm -hmm. I think actually matching it with the model has been a different story, but we at least know that there are differences that silicon feature doesn't look the same across all brown dwarfs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What is the possibility of finding a, um, a similar system? I'm sure people I, are I think it's very likely. There are a lot of isolated red L dwarfs. It's just, you know, do people want to do the benchmark thing or the flashy thing? So, um, I mean, that, that's... I. <laughs> Okay, yes, yes. <laughs> the dichotomy of it all. <laughs> I I mean, yeah. I I I hope someone is looking at red Eldors. I think there um I think there is one go proposal in. Uh we'll see how that um that plays out, but yeah, I I think we'll be we'll be shocked at things we already know about still. So, yeah. Absolutely. Very cool. Very cool. Brittany, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely article again. <laughs> Very nice. And that'll do. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you. You take care. Bye-bye.